Um, a lot of other stuff has been added to uh, the facility over the years. So uh, passive optical instrumentation was added. Uh, the surface was upgraded, and I'll show you some pictures of that at the moment. They added an S-band, uh, 2.3 uh, gigahertz radar for, for planetary work, um, some active uh, laser LIDAR facility uh, stuff for looking at the, uh, at the atmosphere, the uh, neutral and ionized atmosphere, um, and a major upgrade to avoid this problem with the line feed, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, they added a ground screen to reduce the, the noise. So this process has been going on all the time. So the facility might be 50 years old, but it has been continually updated, and it is as modern today as it was relative to, the, to 50 years ago. So this is the uh, upgrade of the, of the surface going on. So I said that it was a, a mesh surface originally. Um, that limited the upper frequency that one could use with the dish. So they wanted to try and push the upper uh, frequency limit of the dish up, particularly for radio astronomy. Uh, and uh, they surfaced the, the dish whoops, uh, with mul multiple um, uh, aluminum panels, perforated aluminum panels, something like 38,000 of them or so, that cover the entire surface of the dish. So this is, you see them putting them in place. And they, each one of them is adjusted separately, and it maintains the shape of the spherical reflector to within two millimeters over the entire area of the dish. Um, and uh, actually, we, we keep trying to push the, the operating frequency up higher and higher and higher. It's, it's up around 10 gigahertz or, or so at the moment, and we'd really like to go higher. Um, this is actually a picture from uh, recently um, under, the, under the dish. And so uh, here you can see the, the bottom of that um, uh, perforated aluminum surface. Um, obviously, it lets a fair amount of light through, although nothing like as much as, as, as around the dish. And there's a complete sort of ecology going on under here. Um, these guys are busy pouring the foundations for some new pieces of equipment that are going under the dish. But you can see all this uh, um, um, uh, ferns and so on growing under here. And actually, we encourage that to grow because if it would die away and we just had bare ground under there, all the water running down the sides of the, of the uh, depression would start to erode the ground and cause us really quite serious problems. In its own way, it causes problems, however, because it grows up and it starts coming through the surface of the dish. So, <laughs> so the, the current plan is to get a herd of goats. It'll have to be quite a big herd, though, because, you know, there's 20 acres of stuff underneath there, so. Uh, okay. So. Um, so that was the uh, improvement in the surface. They also, uh, as I said, added a, a ground screen around the outside. They strengthened the cables, actually added some more cables. And they added a whole Gregorian feed. Um, so that uh, thing that looks like a big golf ball hanging up there that you've seen in the pictures is the Gregorian feed, uh, plus this new S-band transmitter. And so effectively, they changed the system from being a passive observing uh, device to much more of a, of a full-time um, uh, active radar for, uh, at 430 for the ionosphere and at uh, 2 point something gigahertz for the planetary radar. Uh, and this process added a huge complexity of more receivers and so on. So uh, here's a picture of the of the spillover, this this fence that was put around. Oops, let me go back. This fence that was put around the outside. So here's here's the surface of the dish, and you you see it's supported on multiple cables, uh, all anchored around this this wall around the top edge of the dish. And then this fence was added to prevent uh, spillover and reduce the noise and in going into the receivers. That's the uh, control room that you can see just up at the top there. Um, now, let's talk about this Gregorian feed uh, for a bit. So, um, and I explained that uh, the, the signal comes to, to a line uh, focus. Well, that, that's fine, and you can match that with a line feed, as you saw for the, for the uh, 430 megahertz radar. But there really isn't that much space, so if you, if you want to have a different frequency, you need a whole different line feed. So, you've got to move one out and put another one in. And that really limited what could be done. And so they started scratching their heads and said, well, what, what can we do to change that line focus to a point focus? And the answer was this, this Gregorian structure. So they introduced two more reflectors, a, a secondary and a tertiary reflector. Uh, the secondary, um, this one here, which looks a bit like Darth Vader's helmet. Um, so the, here's the signal coming up from the dish, and it is reflected off this one 
into the tertiary here, and the combination of the two brings it to a point focus here. So this is some sort of deep magic to, to actually come up with the shape of those two reflectors that would cause that to happen, and it was done by, by ray tracing, basically, it is iteratively determining what the shape should be. Um, and so here's, here's this thing. This uh, dome is something like uh, a little short of 100 feet. It's about 80 feet across. So this is uh, around 100 tons of extra equipment went up there onto the, onto the platform to do this. Um, the, uh, the bottom is open, so that's where it sees the, the dish. Uh, the, tertiary is up, uh, the secondary is up inside here, and the tertiary uh, just inside the, the dome here. Here's, here's a view looking up into the bottom. So here you can see the tertiary reflector. And the, the at focus is actually below that little room there, so inside of that. Um, the, uh, as you move this dome back and forth along that track, you move the line feed in the opposite direction, so you keep things kind of balanced on there, because you're moving you know, a, large, a large weight around on this suspended platform. Um, here's a little sketch uh, looking at the side of this dome. So here, here's the secondary reflector with green and the, and the tertiary down here. And the, so the signal come up, comes up from the dish here and is reflected on this one, comes onto this point. And at this point, there's a rotary floor. So it's a bit like um, the situation at the bottom of a microscope where you have rotary turret with the different lenses, except this is all much, much bigger. And it enables us to put a whole string of different receivers for different frequencies. And indeed, the S-Pan transmitter is there. And just by rotating the right one into place, it arrives at the focus of the dish. And to give you an idea of, this, of the scale here, uh, this is a little staircase here, 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 here. This is the way that you can get into this thing. So you, you can actually climb down the outside of this thing and go inside. And, you, and indeed, our platform crew has to do that on a regular basis in order to, to replace receivers and you know, do maintenance and so on. So this was a, a really magic device. Here, here's the, uh, um, not a photograph, but a, but a computer simulation of the of, of that uh, rotary floor and the, and the equipment that's on it. So for, here's the 4, 430 megahertz feed and, and so on. Um, and so that and it made a, a huge improvement in the, in the utility of the, of the system and the speed with which you could change from one band to another. Um, another big improvement that came along a little later was to not only have one uh, focus, one, one receiver at the focus, but to put a small array there. And uh, um, you can see uh, here in this picture, the, there are seven uh, wave, uh, little horns and waveguide feeds uh, for this um, uh, L-band um, uh, receiver, which enables it to put seven little spots on the sky at once. And this is an instrument that has been used now to survey the radio sky uh, and has produced um, surveys uh, far more quickly and in far more detail than has been possible with anything else. Um, we haven't completed the surveys of the sky with this yet, but we're, we're within a couple of years of doing that. And I'm sure the pressure is going to be to do it again once it's been done the first time. And there's currently an effort going on to, to come up with uh, um, a, a replacement for this that has more like 40 feeds or so. Uh, so it's, it's like a 40-pixel you know, camera looking at the sky. Um, down here, you can see it being hoisted up towards the, uh, towards the Gregorian dome. Um, so. Uh, these things, when they're going to be changed, uh, they're lowered or winched up and down through that hole in the middle of the dish that you've that you probably noticed and uh, serviced on site. Uh, I mentioned uh, that you can climb down the outside of the dome. Here's the outside of the dome with the stairs on the outside. Uh, if you're scared of heights, you don't go anywhere near that thing. I don't like it up there. Um, and here's that, uh, that uh, uh, alpha... Uh, al um, survey instrument uh, in the transmitter bay actually when, after it had been serviced and before it was put back up. Uh, it was supposed to be being put back up today, in fact, um, but for reasons I'll mention later, it's uh, still sitting in the, uh, back in the, uh, in, the, in, in the electronic shop. So uh, just to summarize the core areas of research, um, there's no other observatory that can match the, the breadth of things that Arecibo is able to do. Um, there's no other astronomical telescope uh, that uh, acts like a radar as well. Uh, Goldstone does uh, for deep space tracking, but uh, in, in terms of the sorts of things that Arecibo does, it's kind of unique. Uh, and uh, it has real application in multiple areas that are really relevant to, to people like uh, space weather and climate change and asteroid impacts and so on. And I'll, I'll show you some of those things. 
Um, another thing that's really strange about Arecibo, or really different about Arecibo compared to most of the facilities um, around the country, is that it has a dedicated visitor center. This was uh, funded by uh, the Angel Ramos Foundation, so the Angel Ramos Fa Visitor Center, and it stands right on the edge of the dish. It has uh, a nice uh, balcony overlooking the edge of the dish, and it is visited by enormous numbers of people every year. Um, so. Um, it's about 10 years old. It's just had its 10 years uh, uh, anniversary. Here's the numbers of visitors each year going to Arecibo. So we're in the order of 100,000 visitors a year. And here's a comparison with uh, some of the other facilities uh, around the world. And I see that I've put it right down in the bottom where I can't read it. Um, but uh, here you can see things like the VLA and, um, and so on. So Arecibo is, is way more than anybody else in terms of visitors. And it's something that we tried to exploit. Uh, we had the millionth visitor through there in 2006, so in a, in a little under 10 years. We've had 300,000 school children. That's about a half the population of Puerto Rico, and schools go through the system already. Uh, and we're really pushing the, the education public outreach through the vehicle of, of, the, uh, of the visitor center. Uh, it has a museum. It has a um, lecture theaters and, and whatever. It's a, it's a wonderful resource, and I think it's a way that we really ought to be trying to push other, other facilities to go. Let me say something now um, about what the sort of things that we're doing um, and um, talk about some of the results that have been obtained by the, by the system. Um, often these telescopes don't work you know, by themselves, they work with other things. And so uh, this is uh, showing how the Arecibo system is part of the very long baseline interferometry setups around the world where you combine signals from multiple telescopes to get the angular resolution corresponding to the distance between your telescopes. Uh, so you don't, gain, you don't get the gain that you would have from a single big dish, but you get resolution. Arecibo gives you gain, but it doesn't give you resolution that you, of the sort of thing that you can get from this, this VLBI. But adding, adding Arecibo to these networks dramatically increases their sensitivity. Um, here's an example that's to give you a feel for, for what the contribution is. So the, this is a, a whole set of radio telescopes looking at the same source. Uh, everything from Arecibo here, the big, big curve at the back here, and then Vesterbork, which is a synthesis telescope in, in the Netherlands, and Effelsberg, the one in, in Germany that I mentioned, and then also a satellite born antenna that gives you an even greater spacing. You look at the huge amount more signal that, that, uh, that Arecibo contributes to that uh, compared to even uh, Effelsberg or Vesterbork, and you see just what an important part of this, this mechanism this is. And so that enables you to get very, very detailed information about the, the, uh, the angular uh, uh, shape of, of objects in the sky, of radio things in the sky. Um, and here's uh, an example, uh, actually not with interferometry, but with, with the main part of the dish, looking at uh, the range and three-dimensional structure of, of uh, one of the star clusters. This is in, out in uh, Perseus here in the supercluster, um, for which um, Martha Haynes and uh, Giovanni from... Uh, from uh, uh, Cornell won this uh, award in uh, 1989. And so there's a lot of that sort of survey stuff is done by Arecibo. It's, it's an amazing instrument for this purpose. But an awful lot of what you hear about Arecibo is to do with its preeminence in its ability to measure the timing of pulsars. So uh, pulsars are, are um, uh, uh, highly magnetized, very rapid, usually rapidly rotating neutron stars, so very, very small stars with very strong magnetic fields, and the magnetic field is, is normally not parallel with the rotation axis. And they generate a lot of electromagnetic uh, emissions, radio um, and, and some higher frequency stuff, um, but it's very much controlled by these super powerful magnetic fields. And so the uh, result is that they actually radiate in, in very tight beams. So that it's like a lighthouse. It's spinning there. And uh, so if we're observing it from far away, we see it go flash, 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 flash. They're very small, very compact, very, very heavy objects. And it turns out that the timing of pulsars is one of the most precise timing devices that exists anywhere. So we can use them as sort of super clocks for looking at what's going on in the universe. Now, uh, the first one was discovered not at Arecibo, but uh, in, in the UK at, at Cambridge by Jocelyn Bell and Tony Hewish. Um, I'm not absolutely sure that this is a plot of the very first pulsar, uh, but I am going to play you the sound of the very first pulsar. So that's the noise of this radio signal coming in from that pulsar as it spins. 
So this is a star that's going around that fast. This is an amazing object. There have been subsequently discovered many pulsars that go around in milliseconds. So they're really amazing objects. Um, when Jocelyn Bell and Tony Hewish first heard this, they said, sounds like intelligence. And they called it Little Green Man 1. And they were subsequently very embarrassed. Uh, uh, in a rather strange thing, you know, I pointed out that Arecibo was built as, a, as an incurrent scatter radar, but became very much used as a radio astronomy facility. Well, the antenna that Jocelyn Bell used to do this observation uh, was subsequently dismantled from Cambridge, and it was moved to the university where I was, and I used it for my PhD in incurrent scatter. So it's kind of strange, isn't it? That build this for incurrent scatter, use it for radio astronomy, build that for radio astronomy, use it for incurrent scatter. Um, Jocelyn Bell, well, Tony Hewish actually got the Nobel Prize for that, for the first, first pulsar. Um, so everybody started looking for pulsars, and uh, in 1993, the uh, physics Pri Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, Joe Taylor and Russell Holtz from P Princeton for discovering the first binary pulsar uh, with Arecibo. Um, and uh, um, in a binary pulsar where you have an, uh, the binary, uh, two stars, two massive stars going around each other, the uh, gravitational fields are huge in the vicinity of those stars, such that you begin to see the distortion of space and time as predicted by Einstein's general theory in, in relativity. And so actually what you see is that these pulsars slow down. They slow down because they're radiating gravitational energy. And the theory said that this line down here is the, is the way that it should slow down with time. And, uh, and the, the dots on there are actually the data. So it was a very elegant demonstration uh, of the uh, correctness of, of uh, Einstein's theory, or at least in, in this particular case. Uh, here's actually uh, Russell Hulls at Arecibo in 1974 when they made the observation. So just after uh, uh, Tony Hewish had got the prize the first time around. You see, they'd, they'd come by, I guess this is a PDP computer in here. They'd, they'd come by this thing, which was then, you know, really cutting edge and whatever, and they packed it up in these, these wooden crates and they shipped it off to Arecibo and plugged it in and started uh, uh, analyzing these noise, noise light signals looking for, for, for pulsars. And um, as they found them, they put little X's on the side of the box up there. <laughs> so a bit like bomber missions, putting your bombs on the side of the plane. You know? um, and uh, as I said, they, uh, they got the Nobel Prize. This is, uh, this is Joe Taylor and, uh, and the Nobel Prize for that. Um, the uh, um, con uh, search for pulsars co has continued and, and uh, so sort of strange uh, pulsar objects have been discovered. The first extrasolar system planets were discovered uh, by Alex Wilshan at Arecibo in uh, 1990 when uh, he noticed the uh, sort of cyclical variation in the timing of the arrival of, pulsar, of pulsars from a millisecond pulsar and deduced that, that, was the, it, that there were um, smaller objects, actually probably Jupiter-sized objects, um, in orbit about it. Um, and uh, actually they deduced uh, initially two and subsequently thought that there were three uh, uh, planets here. Uh, here's here's the, the pulsar, a very small neutron star. Uh, in comparison, here's our sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, and the Earth here. And so these things are much closer. And these aren't habitable planets in the way that we understand them. So they probably don't have aliens who speak English on them. Um, uh, he didn't get a Nobel Prize, he got a stamp. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty cool, actually, I mean, come to think of it. So this, this, he's Polish, and the, the, the Polish uh, postal system put out a whole page of stamps uh, of uh, famous scientists, both living and dead, and paired them up in pairs of, uh, um, I think that's Copernicus uh, sitting behind him there, and, uh, and, and Alex. And he's still very active in our field, and um, maybe you'll get a Nobel Prize in due course. And these uh, sort of obs new observations with Arecibo uh, continue. This is a recent observation of the coolest... Uh, 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 dwarf stars uh, seen and reported um, I think, uh, about halfway through last year. Um, and now something that's really right up to date and, and, and again in pulsars. This was published in Nature a week ago. Um, and uh, uh, here you can see the, the variation of the timing of, of, a, of a pulsar and, and it seems that it has this very clean sort of structure that you might expect from two, two uh, the stars in, in 
orbit about each other. But when you, when you look at the fine detail here, you see, actually, there's a little ripple on top of that. So when they try and, and fit this with a, a two-body rotating uh, uh, structure, then the residuals are still quite large. It doesn't work. Uh, if you think that it's three stars, then you actually can get rid of the residuals altogether. And so this turns out to be a neutron star or, or a pulsar uh, with two white dwarfs in orbit about it, um, both or they're in orbit about each other. They're about their common center of gravity. Uh, one very close in, one a little further out, but the further out is still closer to the to the uh, pulsar than the Earth is to the Sun, for example. And so here's the little. Uh, uh, um, cartoon of this arrangement. So here's the, here's the pulsar and the one of the white dwarfs and the other one much further out there. Now, this is a really uh, esoteric sort of uh, gravitational uh, uh, environment. Much higher fields than we saw in the, with, the, with the single, with, with the, the, the binary. Um, and uh, potentially this has the ability to be able to really test Einstein theory and perhaps demonstrate that it finally doesn't quite work. Um, so, if that turns out to be the case, these guys are going to get Nobel Prize too. I think I'm in the wrong field. <laughs>